But he brought me in all oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Good morning. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to FBC. Uh, my name is Zach, and we're really excited you're here. If this is your first time, if you fill out just the info in the Connect section of the bulletin, leave that in the offering. We're not going to spam you, but we'd love to get to know you. Um, this, this morning, we have Steve Hopkins with the State Convention here. He's going to be preaching. We're really excited to hear from you, Steve. First service was a great message, so um, just be ready for that. So uh, some quick announcements. I'm going to try and fly through these because we've got a lot. Um, you can sign up for Wednesday night Bible studies out here in the foyer on this side. Uh, there's three different ones. Um, I'm going to be teaching one, Chrissy and Pastor Chris. Uh, I'm going to be teaching one with Pastor Scott. And then Chrissy and Pastor Chris are going to be teaching one as well. It's going to be great. Um, so check out those sign-ups there. Um, we have an interest meeting today for choir and signers. And we really need you, if you're interested in those, please come to the meeting immediately after service. Uh, the choir's in the choir room. And the signers are meeting in A2 all the way down at the end of the hall. Um, we also have a new members class coming up. Uh, Discover FBC Lancaster. This is August 25th, uh, right after second service. Um, lunch is provided. You can sign up with the contact card. If you're a, a guest or you're interested in learning more about the church or you've never gone through the membership class, I've gone through it. It's excellent. It's really, really good. It's not just boring, okay, I'm going to check this off box. It's, it's stuff that is essential to being a healthy church member. Um, I really, really would encourage you to check it out. And then we have a pool party at Tiki Pool this Friday, August 16th at 8 p.m. Admission is free, um, so please bring a snack to share. It'll be a great time for us as a church. I hope to see you there. So let's hop into prayer, and we'll continue in worship. God, we're so grateful for who you are, for what you've done for us. Um, we're so grateful that you would call us your children that we would be able to have a relationship with you and that out of that, 
you give us a love for others, a love for those around us. And I pray that you would just help us to rely on you as the foundation, the cornerstone of our lives, that we would center ourselves on you and knowing that you are so good and that when we choose to obey you, that that is an, a, a, a trust. That's us saying, we know you are good. We know you desire the best for us in every situation and in every season. We love you. We want to worship you as a church together. Lift our voices, lift our hearts, because you are holy, you're set apart, you're worthy of worship, and you're wonderful. And we love you, God. We just ask this all in your name. Amen. I invite you to continue worshiping with us. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. You beautiful voices, let's lift this up. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same.
they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be summer and winter and springtime You're always faithful. You're always good. And we can trust you. And I just pray that uh, as, we, as we give this offering, that uh, it wouldn't be out of guilt or compulsion, but out of joy for what you're doing. We're seeing your kingdom um, come. We want your will to be done. Uh, and we just ask that you would bless the ministries of our church. Uh, it's for your glory, not for ours. And we love you. It's in your name. You may be seated. I cast my mind to Calvary when Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance here by 
heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. To praise the name of the Lord our God, who oh, praise His name for. The Son of Heaven rose again, who trampled death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. He's worthy, church. So praise the Amen. Uh, all the time. All the time. Lord, we just love to worship you. We just love to worship you. Thank you uh, for your spirit. Thank you for your son. Um, and I just pray as, as we continue that our worship doesn't stop, but we continue through the hearing of the word and that we apply it to our lives. We just ask this in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. You may be seated. I'd like to introduce Steve Hopkins. He's going to give the word this morning. 
Thank you. Great time of worship. We were in that worship, and I said, this is really good. I sure hope the preacher doesn't mess it up. <laughs> and then I realized, uh, but uh, it is really good to be with you. I'm excited to be here today and be able to share. I have huge respect uh, for your pastor, uh, Brother R. I've known him a long time, and it's just uh, exciting to be here with you and see what God's doing in your midst and see Jesus at work for his glory and his honor. Thank you, Zach. And uh, I uh, told the first service, I was, uh, when I come into a place where I've never preached before, I'm always kind of looking over the platform situation and particularly the pulpit. And, uh, you know, I came in here this morning and there's nothing. Uh, and um, I thought, what am I going to do? And, uh, but there, there's a little story behind that, um, true story. This is not a preacher story, this is a true story. Um, when I uh, went away to college, I went down to uh, Georgetown College to try to prepare. I felt like God would call me to ministry, and so I was there to prepare and go through college and seminary and all those kinds of things. And, and um, I was a freshman there at Georgetown, and uh, in the, that far, first uh, fall or so, somewhere along through there, uh, one of the um, churches in Germantown, Kentucky, it's about an hour away, it's northern part of Kentucky, uh, the pastor was in a real bad automobile accident on Wednesday night after the service, broke his leg in about four places, pretty serious. And so on Thursday, they called the campus and said, we need somebody to preach for us on Sunday. And Dr. Joe Lewis was taking those calls at that particular time. And Dr. Lewis said to them, this is Thursday. Everybody we've got who can preach is already scheduled. Uh, I'm sorry, but we're all booked. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're desperate. We, we just need a warm body. Um, and uh, he said, well, I... Uh, I've got a freshman who thinks he can preach. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Lewis uh, called me up and said, would you go up to Germantown and preach? Said, told me the situation. I said, yes, sir, I'll be happy to do that. I had only preached one time before in my home church on a youth Sunday. Uh, you know, kind of one of those Sundays where they let one of the youth preach, I'd preached. And, and so I got out that sermon I'd preached on youth Sunday and, and, and kind of worked a little bit, added a few things to it to make it a little bit longer or something like that. I drove up to Germantown. You can imagine I was nervous. Um, just my first time out kind of thing. And, and that was back when they used to have preachers always come and sit on the platform. Some of you remember those days. And if you're my generation, you remember those. And they invited me to come up front and sit on the platform. And so here I am sitting on the platform nervous, and everybody's looking at me. I just added to my nervousness, as you can imagine. And I began to shake. And as I began to shake, uh, the chair began to shake with me. Um, I had learned later that the church had been there 125 years, and I think that chair had been there, all of them. And uh, it was pretty wobbly. And so I, I got nervous about that, and I reached over in the choir loft behind me, and there was a metal folding chair there. And I grabbed that metal folding chair, and I moved it around front. I thought, this thing, won't, this thing won't hold me up. And so that just increased the nervousness. And I got up to preach, and I've kind of always had the philosophy, you know, if you can't do it right, do it hard. And so... Um, I decided I was going to just really get into my first point, and that was going to take care of my nervousness. And when I laid into my first point, I went into the pulpit. And what I didn't know was the pulpit there was a homemade pulpit, and I, I do believe the dear soul that had made it had made it out of quarter-inch plywood. I, I think it probably weighed all of about three pounds. And you understand when 200-plus pounds goes into three, it's the three that gives, Right. And so when I let in my first point, that pulpit scooted out about six inches off the front of the platform. Well, thankfully, I caught it before it tumbled. I moved it back into place, and I thought the best thing for me to do is to stay away from this thing. And so it was one of those pulpits, and some of you remember the pulpits, they've got kind of some wings out here, and then they've got a raised part in the middle where your Bible goes. And that's the way it was built. And so I decided I was going to walk out beside the pulpit. I laid my hand down on that raised part and started walking out beside the pulpit, what I didn't know was the dear soul that had made that pulpit had not attached the top part to the bottom part. <laughs> so as I laid my hand down and began to walk this way, the top part came with me. <laughs> and I thought, this ought not to be so. And so uh, I eased that back into place, and I thought, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to try to get this thing done. So it came time for the invitation. The church I grew up in was built similar to this, and uh, we had, you know, the platform, there were three, two steps or three steps down in the front, and I had always watched the pastor come down front to give the invitation, and so I thought that's the way it's supposed to be done, and so I was trying to do what my high school speech teacher had taught me to do. I was trying to maintain eye contact, and I, you know, I grabbed my Bible, Billy Graham style, and I was doing my best just to maintain eye contact and to give the invitation, 
and I got ready to give the invitation, and I got about right here to the front of the platform, and I kicked an offering box. One of those little plastic churches with a slot in the top of it, you know, I don't know, they took up birthday offerings or something in it. And when I kicked that, though, it was a really good thing because it caused me to lose eye contact and look down and realize for the first time it was a three-foot drop off the front of the platform. The steps were on either end. There were no steps in the front. And uh, had I not kicked that box and looked down, I would have stepped out into nothing and been flat on my face. And so, the, and of course, the crazy thing is they invited me back for three more weeks. Um, they, they thought I was the best show in town. <laughs> But it is really a special privilege for me to be here with you. I'm excited about the opportunity. I do serve as one of your cooperative program missionaries here in Ohio. And I had the privilege of pastoring uh, here in Ohio. I spent 22 years uh, as a pastor. My last pastor was Whitehall Baptist Church, which is up in Columbus. And uh, got to serve there. And then now I've served, been serving as one of your uh, cooperative program missionaries. We have about 725 congregations somewhere in that facility, uh, vicinity uh, in Ohio. My responsibility is anything I can do to come alongside pastors and church leaders to help them. And that's my primary responsibility. My second responsibility is the prayer initiative. And uh, then we work with church revitalization. So that's kind of what, what I do in a, in, in a nutshell. But uh, it's just really fun. When Art uh, called me several months ago and said, would you hold this date? I said, yes, sir. I'd be excited to do that and be excited to come down. I don't live too far from me. I live in Pataskala. So I could come back the back roads down through here. It's about a 35-minute drive. It's really nice. Uh, Last no, two weeks ago, I had a two and a half hour drive for an eight o'clock service. So that was, you know, this was a whole lot better. <laughs> but uh, it's just uh, really excited about being with you. And I'm excited that Pastor Art has you in a series of messages right now in the book of Acts. Our world is facing some challenging times. I mean, that's a, kind of one of those no brainers. Uh, you didn't come here to hear me say that. You know that. Uh, and, and we're, I mean, just a week ago, we had the, the news of what taking place in El Paso and Dayton and so forth. And I was over in Dayton on Friday and working with some of those pastors and handling all that. And it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, the world is going through some shattering times. And the church needs to be the one place the world can find some stability, some strength. The one place the world can find a a place, a, a place to put their feet on, to, to stand on a, on a sure foundation. And, and amidst all the changing times that are happening around us. And it, it's, if you study the book of Acts, you'll know that the world was going through some pretty drastic things as the church was being founded. And the church was figuring out its way to maneuver through all the things that were taking place there. And, and the book of Acts, the, the church was establishing itself as a, as a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. And so uh, Acts is, is, is all about that, and it, and, and it helps. And in the midst of that, the church had been given the final command, what sometimes we call the Great Commission. They'd been told to go to all the world with the gospel. And they're trying to figure out, how do we do that in the midst of everything that's going on around us? I mean, just think about what, what those group of men and women who had gathered in the upper room and then later were there for the ascension. Uh, I mean, physically, how they were going to go to all the world. There was no way for them to travel. I mean, the, the majority of travel was, was on foot during that day and time. Uh, how are they going to go to all the world? Geographically, the whole world hadn't even been discovered. They didn't even know where we are now existed. So how were they going to go to the whole world? They, they didn't know that existed. Uh, uh, legally, it was illegal. For them to, to mention the name of Jesus. I mean, the Roman government said, Caesar is the only Lord. Jesus cannot be Lord. You, you can't talk that way. So legally, they were, they were facing challenges. Financially, th there was no wealth in, in the early church. Uh, they were socially, many of them misfits and rejects. And, and, and logistically, when Jesus gave them the command to go to all the world with the gospel, uh, I mean, the, if you study that command, you know he's saying it, do it right now. It, it's not do it in phases. It's not get started here and then maybe someday get to the ends of the earth. He said, we need to do it all right now. So how were they going to, to tackle uh, that place? Robert Quinn, when he's writing about it, he says they were building the bridge as they walked across it in, in, in many ways. And, 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 and so I began to ask myself, if, if we were in the early church, if I could bring some of the members of the early church here today and just 
give them a few seats across the stage, and, and let's just have a chat and ask them, what'd you do? What is it that you could do that would help us today? What could translate in, in today's? I, I really don't believe that they would give us strategies and philosophies. I, I, I really don't believe they would give us diagrams and flow charts for success. I, I don't believe they'd teach us how to organize a worship service or write a curriculum for our small groups. I, I, I really don't believe there'd be formulas or policy manuals or methodologies. I really come to believe that what they would do would just share the story of what Jesus was doing in their midst. They'd just tell us about the things Jesus was doing. And I've come to believe that by reading the book of Acts, because that's what they do in the book of Acts. That's what Luke does throughout Acts. He just tells the story of how Jesus was at work. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to meet you in just a few minutes in Acts chapter 3, if you want to be turning there uh, and, and look there. I, I told the early service, you know, I grew up in that generation where preachers used to always say, it's music to my ears to hear you turning the pages of the Bible as you turn to your passage. And I, I understand nowadays, and nowadays it's a little bit different. So I'm just really blessed when I see the warm glow of the Spirit on your face when you turn your Bible on. <laughs> so whether you've got a tablet or a phone or a hard copy, whatever you've got, uh, meet me in, in just a minute. I'm not there yet, but meet me in just a minute in, in Acts chapter 3. To, to lead up to that, I think we just really need to be reminding you of what Acts is all about. Acts is, 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 is all about how that they saw Jesus at work. I mean, Luke, who's the writer, his first volume, which is the gospel as Luke records it, in his first volume, he tells us these are eyewitness accounts to what Jesus was doing. In his second volume, which is the book of Acts, he tells us this is what he, he makes a statement there. This is what Jesus began to do, and it's what Jesus continues to do. He, he was just simply telling them about how Jesus was still at work uh, through the church. That's what the book of, book of Acts is all about. And, and, and in your Bible, you may have a label. So, some Bibles label the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles. Some people label the book of Acts the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I, I like what John R.W. Stott says. John R.W. Stott says, These are the continuing words and deeds of Jesus by his Spirit through the Apostles. Now, John R.W. Stott's a lot smarter than I am, but I want to change one word in that. Here's what I believe Acts is all about. Acts is all about the continuing works of Jesus. I, I, I like that part. The continuing words and deeds of Jesus by his spirit, but it's through the church. That's what Acts is all about. It's through the church. And the reason I like to change, make that change, because that, that just tells me what we're all about here today. We're about the continuing words of Jesus through his spirit that he does through his church, the people of God. And, 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 and so we're a part of that. And we can be an exciting part to see uh, what God has done. And, and, and God continues to want them to Because, see, it's, it's all about Jesus. Now, I, just let me just remind you of some things that, in, in the book of Acts. Again, we're going to Acts 3. I'll get there in a second. But just think about how many times you hear about what the Lord does. Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church. Acts 3 and 6, which we're going to read in a minute. And verse 19, it's in the name of Jesus that healing takes place. And times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 7 and 55, the Lord receives Stephen. Acts 9 and 5 and 10, the Lord stopped Saul on the road to Damascus and prepared Ananias to share with him. Acts 11 and 21, when that church is sending out missionaries, it says the hand of the Lord was with them. Acts 16 and 14, it says the Lord Jesus opened the heart of Lydia as she shared. In Acts 18 and 9, it says the Lord Jesus spoke to Paul and said, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you. You see, all the way through the book, it's, it's all about Jesus, this continuing activity. That Jesus is the living Lord, and he's still active in the book of Acts. And he's still a part of what's going on. And, and we see that day in and day out. And, and, and you remember those disciples? In, in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, you know, the disciples first say to Jesus, Okay, Jesus, uh, this is the time, right? You're going to restore your kingdom. And you hear what those disciples are saying to Jesus. Okay, for three and a half years, we've been wandering around the, the, the countryside with you, and we've been watching you do all this work. The time for all that's done, right? Because we're going to stop now, and we're going to watch you build your kingdom. And they were kind of saying, build it, and they will come. 
kind of philosophy. And Jesus says, no, fellows, that's not what it's about. He answers them, and at first flush, you think he didn't understand their question until you really understand what he's saying to them. His, his answer to their question was, no, you shall be witnesses to me. He says, what's going to happen is you're going to keep telling people about me. I'm still going to be at work, and you're going to keep pointing people to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You're going to keep telling them about who I am. And, and he says, what we've been through the first three and a half years is just boot camp. Now the real, real thing starts. You're going to be witnesses to me, and, and, and you're going to share the message, and, and, and they're to be those witnesses. And that's the, the challenging that, that led them to become the powerful movement that they were. I, I like uh, Nick Ripkin. Some of you have seen the, the, the video, The Insanity of God, or you've read his book, Insanity of God, and then the follow-up book, Insanity of Obedience. I like what he says in Insanity of Obedience. He says, he says we today can live the Bible that is present active tense. We know that everything that God has ever done, he is still doing. The reality is that, that his method is still consistent. We are to tell people about Jesus, explain exactly who Jesus is, and then live our lives as an example of what it means to follow Jesus and to follow him passionately. That's where we need to be found. And that's what we need to be doing. Acts 3 is, is a great example of how we can live the Bible present active tense and, and to see Jesus at work. Acts 3 is a key transitional point. It's a pivotal point. Uh, if you study the book of Acts, it, it's where it launches them into some what's going to end up being persecution and all that's take place. And it, it, it's a key pivot point. It's, it's the intersection of God's design for what he was doing with the church. And, and what he was doing in the lives of people. So if you found your way there now, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. And, and I, I want to read, let's just start with, with verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now stop there with me for just a moment. Because here's the first point that you need to understand. It says Peter and John. Peter and John, we, we often find them together. I mean, they were in business, a fishing business together when Jesus called them. And, uh, throughout the, 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 the gospel, Peter and John are often together. And Peter and John were the two that ran to the, to the tomb that first Easter morning together. And, and we find them together. We also find a little bit of conflict at times with them. We find them part of that, that conflict when somebody's arguing over who's going to be the greatest among you and all those kinds of things. But here, they are together and they're going to pray. Here's the, the very first thing that I, that I want you to see. To, to see Jesus at work, we have got to be praying together. The church in the book of Acts is the story of prayerful dependence. They understood what it meant to pray together. And it, it was so critical for them. As a matter of fact, if you, when you read the book of Acts, you'll find out 26 times out of 28 chapters, they are praying together. Now, I'm not saying they didn't have private prayer times. Private prayer times, you still need that. But they understood as a church how critical it is for them to pray together. And for them, prayer was absolutely essential. Let me try to illustrate. I, I am, I'm real thankful that I got two arms. And it's kind of handy, as they say, to have two uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm really grateful that I have two legs. They don't work as well as they used to. My knees are kind of Rice Krispie knees. You know, they snap, crackle, and pop. But, but that's, that's part of it. And they still work, and I'm thankful. And it helps me get around. But you understand, if I lose a leg or an arm, I'm going to make it. It won't be as convenient, but I'll make it. But you also understand there are parts of my body that are called vital organs. They're called vital organs for a reason. Because if I lose a vital organ, I'm in real big trouble. I, I can't function unless something is done to replace that vital organ. You need to understand prayer is a vital organ for the church. I fear too many times we treat prayer like an arm or a leg. Handy to have around. We like it. But if we can't get to it, 
That's okay. We've got to come to understand that praying together is absolutely vital to seeing Jesus shared with a lost and dying world. These disciples, they understood that. They, they come to that place. They are here to, to pray together. I, I like what Ed Stetzer and Tom Rainer say in the, their book, Transformational Church. Pastors and churches have got to get uncomfortable enough to say, we are not a New Testament church if we don't have a prayer life. This conviction makes us squirm a little, but how else will there be breakthrough with God? See, I believe that's the greatest need in our churches today. As I travel around the state, one of my responsibilities is church revitalization. The very first thing that I've got to do to see church revitalization take place in a, in a church that's really experiencing decline is to get them to start praying together. And, and to get them, one of the first things I say to them, I say is, here's a 40 days of prayer guide, and, and I want you as a church together, no matter what size church they are, I've worked with some as low as four, and, 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 and I said, well, no matter what size you are, we've got to start praying together. And getting them to pray together is absolutely essential to what takes place. We've got to come to that place. Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We're to be a, a people of God. We're to be known as a, as a people of God. Jim Simbola says, I've, I've discovered an aston astonishing truth. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. And, and, and we're, we, we've got to understand that it's, uh, we're dependent upon him for the vitality of the church uh, to spend time in prayer. Lawless says, it was a Chuck Lawless says, a church without the power of God is only a business, and prayer is the primary means by which we tap in to that power. Listen to this quote, and I'm going to tell you afterwards when it was written. Poverty stricken as the church is today in many things, she is most stricken here in the place of prayer. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. That was written by Leonard Ravenhill, 1959, 60 years ago. And if that was true then, how much more is it true today? We've got to be people of pray, and we've got to come about, and, and, and it's important that we learn to pray together. You see that all the through scriptures. When Jesus teaches, 33 of Jesus' 37 teachings on Jesus are about corporate prayer. The, 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 the words are plural. And, and all of those things there, it's, it, it's to come together and to pray together. And I know every time that I start talking about the importance of corporate prayer and people coming together, somebody always comes up to me and says, well, what about Matthew 6, 6? Well, I know Matthew 6, 6. I know Matthew 6, 6 says, when you pray, go into your closet. And that's what they usually quote to me, the King James Version of that verse. When you pray, go into your closet. Here's what you need to understand about that translation. And I'm not against the King James translation. It's, a, it's really done a, a huge work in the life of the church. But you need to understand the King James translation was translated in 1611 under the authority of a man named King James. That's why it gets its name. And if you go back and do some research, you'll find there are some, some of those great palaces that King James built back in the early 1600s. And if you go to tour them today, you can go to the, to the Holy Road House and, and you can tour there. That's in, uh, in Edmundburg, or you can go to Windsor Castle in, in Berkshire. On your tour, there will be listed the King's Closet. And you can go tour the King's Closet. Now, I've not been able to do that physically, but I've done it virtually. I've, I've gone online and looked, up, and looked at pictures of the King's Closet. Here's the fascinating thing you'll find about the King's Closet. The King's Closet was a large room near his private quarters where the king would invite his most closest confidants, his advisors, for the most intimate and personal conversations, some of the most private conversations he would have. He would invite his confidants. If you look at pictures of those, those king's closets, some of those king's closets had grand pianos in them and harps and couches and, and all those kinds of things. They're large rooms. It's not like a little place where he hung his robe but his shoes. 
we're talking about a place where he gathered people for the most important conversations he was going to have. When the 1611 translators were translating this passage, that's what they had in mind. It was not that it's just one place you go by yourself. Though again, I'm not against personal prayer. It was the place where you gathered together with the people of God to pray and seek the face of God about the most important things. We have got to understand. It's so important for us to spend that time. The, the, the early church, they heard all the commands to pray in plural. You just see that all the way through the scriptures. When they heard pray without ceasing, they heard, they heard y'all don't stop praying together <laughs> because it's in plural. We, we've come to understand that and the application is there. You see, we think we need a lot of stuff to do ministry. We think we need buildings and seminaries and bookstores and TV and internet and PowerPoint and projectors. What we need is the power of Almighty God that's only tapped by prayer. You see, the difference between us and the early church is far too often we're not the people praying like they learned to pray. It took a core of men and women gathered together, huddled in the upper room, and changed into a life-changing, world-renowned movement as they sought the face of God. It's so important for us to spend that time in prayer. So the first thing is for us to spend the time in prayer. Now, go back with me to your Bible. Let's pick up number two. And it says a man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful, so that he could beg from those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. Now stop with me there for just a second. Here's this man. We're told in the fourth chapter in verse 22 that he was over 40 years old. He has been there for many years, perhaps all of his life. Had to be carried to the spot in the temple to ask. Peter and John come into the temple. Now, I, I don't know how many times Peter and John may have walked past this man. They may have seen him. They may have given him some alms along the way. I, I don't know. But he had been there, and, and they were frequent people in the temple, so they would have already seen him there. But as they're walking past them this day, they see something different. See, this man was not just broke. He was broken. He, he, he was crippled. He, he was in, in that situation because in, in, in for him, it would have been hopeless. There was no opportunity for him to work. There were no jobs that he could sit at a desk and, and work the computer. That, that was not in that day and time. His identity was, I'm damaged goods. Hopeless. But they saw something different that day. Jesus was prompting them to realize that he wanted to do something in this man's life. Now think about Peter. Peter had just been preaching the chapter before, a powerful message where 3,000 souls were saved. But you don't find Peter going into the temple that day with a stack of business cards, passing them out and saying, hey, let me do your next crusade for you. I mean, you know, that's not Peter, though he had just seen a huge success in numbers, he sees one man lying there in need, and he's prompted by the Spirit of God to speak into that man's life. We have got to start seeing people. The perception that is created when we pray, it cre creates a perception of those in need. And we begin to, to see their need that is there. And Peter and John, I love the way it says that Peter and John looked straight at him. One translation, fixed their gaze upon him. It, it wasn't like we so often do when you see somebody begging, you know, you don't, you don't want to make eye contact. You kind of want to look a different direction because it's just uncomfortable to make eye contact with them. And Peter knew today was the day God was going to do something in this man's life. He, he fixed his gaze upon him, and he looked, looked straight at him, and, 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 and God was going to do a work in this man's life. Do you notice this man doesn't even ask to be healed? There's nothing in this man 
that causes Jesus to do what Jesus is going to do. He has nothing, he, he didn't say heal me because this and this and this is what I've done. Do you understand, Jesus initiates what he's going to do in our life. And through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is going to speak into his life. See, that's the difference between following Jesus and all the religions of the world. The, the, the religions of the world have rituals and, and regulations and, 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 and rules that you've got to keep to earn your way to get the favor of God. Jesus sees us where we are, loves us where we are. He doesn't intend to leave us where we are, but he loves us where we are. He, he saw this man, and through Peter, he knew that he, he was going to, to make a, a difference in his life. And then you get that powerful voice. You still got your Bible open? Look with me in verse 6. But Peter said, and follow me in this verse here, watch this. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold. Can you imagine what the man thought when he heard that? Peter says, I, I, how, how many times before had somebody walked by him and said, I, I've got nothing to give you? I mean, the man's eyes must have dropped. If, if he had a cup, the cup probably fell to the side. Peter says, I don't have silver or gold. Must have just, in that moment, the man thought, I've heard that over and over again. I know you probably got something in your, your wallet, but you're telling me you don't, or whatever. But then Peter says something that's incredible. Peter says to him, follow along there. I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Peter said, I got something better than silver and gold for you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, now listen very carefully what I'm getting ready to say. I am not against meeting physical needs. We need to do that. And, and, and there are times where we have got to to really reach out and, and, you know, we've been our disaster relief teams and all those kinds of things I'm totally in support of. So I, I'm not talking about the fact that we, we don't ever meet physical needs. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But we need to make sure that instead of just giving them our stuff, we're always ready to give them Jesus. They need Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that every time you... You give somebody something, they got to listen to a sermon. I'm not saying that. Sometimes you're giving in a way that plants a seed that opens a door for the gospel later on. But the gospel is the point. And we're, we're to make sure we're, we're sharing Jesus and the gospel. He, he says, this is what I've got for you. Thomas Aquinas was a great theologian early on in the years of the church. And Thomas, some of the great greatest thinking that, that took place in theology today is, is some of it's based very much on Thomas Aquinas' writing. Thomas, Dr. Dr. Aquinas, Dr. Thomas Aquinas was, was visiting in Rome one day, and, and he was walking in the streets of Rome with one of the cardinals of the church. As they were walking the streets of Rome, they came by a beggar that was there, and the cardinal reached into his pocket, and he dropped a silver coin for the beggar to have. He, 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 the cardinal turned to Thomas and said, Thomas, fortunately, we no longer have to say, silver and gold have I none. And Thomas Aquinas looked back at him and he said, unfortunately, we can no longer say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise, take up your bed and walk. See, sometimes we become so comfortable giving them stuff we forget to give them Jesus. That's what this is all about. That's what, it's the gospel. It's sharing Jesus. He says in, in, in the name of Jesus, it's the name of Jesus. You know Acts 4.12, that, that there is no other name under heaven whereby men might be saved, but the name of Jesus. You know Philippians 2, where he says that, that, that God has exalted him and given him a name above every other name, that every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's all about sharing Jesus. Give them stuff, that's okay. But make sure that somewhere along the line you got the gospel in your mind and opportunities, and you look for ways to, to share Jesus with them. Now, here's the last thing I want you to see. 
Pick up with me in verse 7. When that happens, <laughs> this is so huge. There is a praise that leads to a huge time of worship. Look, verse 7. Then taking him by the hand, he raised him up. And at once his feet and his ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Catch this next thing. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. You see, when, when Jesus is at work, it creates an awe and astonishment at what he can do. And it, it, we begin to, to watch Jesus at work, and they begin to see them. And, and, and it's so important. You know, he, he, he once was a lame beggar, and now he's dancing with the stars. I mean, you know, he's leaping and jumping. It's just a huge moment for him. And the people see that, and they recognize what God is doing. Now, I want you to see something about this. Pastor Art may pick up with these later verses later on, but just glance with me. Look down at verse 11. I'll not spend a lot of time there. It says, when he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what's called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, and he says, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power of God and our godliness? You hear what Peter's saying? Peter's saying, now, now, wait a minute, guys, don't miss. This is Jesus at work. It's not me. It's not us. Jesus is the hero of the story. You see, that's, that's what we've got to make sure. As a matter of fact, glance on down with me to verse 16. It says, by faith in his name, the name his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. He says, I, I want you to understand, Jesus is the hero of this story. He, he wanted to point them to Jesus. See, that's what we've got to do. You know, I, I, I get around in a lot of churches in Ohio now. I'm preaching in a different place every week, and occasionally do an interim for a little longer period of time. But like last week, I was in Marion, and the week before that, I was in Cincinnati, and I'll be in Johnstown next, and then I don't, we're all. If I get up on Sunday morning and think, hey, I'm going to drive down there to First Baptist Lancaster, and I'm going to be the hero today. Guess who's not showing up? It says in 1 Corinthians 1, 29 through 31, no flesh can glory in his presence. If I'm here to be the hero, Jesus is not going to have anything to do with it. It says in Isaiah 42, 8, that he will share his glory with no one. Jesus has got to be the hero of everything we do as a church. When, when, when I facilitate a, a workshop, I'll be doing one this week, I can't go in there thinking I'm going to be the hero today. When I coach pastors, I can't say, hey, I'm going to be this dude's hero today. I'm going to rescue him. It's not what it's about. It, it's about making sure Jesus is the hero. Now, here's the hard part for me. I can't be my wife's hero. Oh, I'd like to be. But I've got to make sure Jesus is her hero. I've got two daughters, two son-in-laws. I can't be their hero. Oh, I'd like to be. But I've got to make sure Jesus is their hero. I've got seven grandchildren. Hallelujah. Papa can't be their hero. Papa's goal in life is to make sure Jesus is their hero. That's what we got to be. That's what it's all about. Peter and John understood Jesus was the hero. Do you understand that's what preaching in a worship service is all about? See, think about it for a minute. If, if I came in here this morning to bring a lecture to teach you something. You leave with a page of notes and some head knowledge. May be helpful to you, may not. If I come in this morning to give a motivational talk, and, and that's what my goal is, to be a motivational talk, you, you leave 
with a set of action plans and here's the action plans I've got to carry out this week and I feel motivated to do them so I'm going to give it my best shot. That may work for you, it may not. But if we come in here this morning and we worship and by the spirit of grace, God's grace, what Paul calls the foolishness of preaching, the gospel is shared in some way through his working that I can't explain. You see Jesus. You leave here worshiping. And that makes all the difference in the world. It's a worshiping people that will make a difference out there. You see, I, I'm convinced people aren't looking for somebody who's got all the answers. They're looking for somebody who's got the fragrance of Jesus upon their life. Your neighbors need to see Jesus in you. The people where you work, where you go to school, they need to see Jesus in you. That's what will make the difference for their lives. You see, I don't want you to, to come out of this morning's sermon and saying, oh my God, look at how much I've got to do for you. That's not what it's about. I want you leaving today saying, oh my God, look at how much you have done for me. See, that's what the gospel is all about. I, I love what J.D. Greer says. You can summarize the gospel in four words. He, Jesus in my place. That's what it's all about. Jesus in my place. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for me and for you to live in our place, to give us life where we have known death. And Jesus Christ is what it's all about. It's Jesus in my place. That's the, the gospel truth that we share. That's what the world needs to see. And, and, and my life is motivated. What makes me swing my feet over the edge of the bed in the morning is what Jesus has done for me, not what I can do for him. And it's a whole different way of living for his glory and his honor. At the beginning of 2019, I did some study. Some of you may have already done this. and You've, I know, heard of St. Patrick. And, and and we have one of our holidays here in the United States called St. Patrick's Day. And, and, and But, you know, St. Patrick has really been just really distorted. St. Patrick doesn't have anything to do with green leprechauns and rainbows and pots of gold at the end of the rainbow or he certainly doesn't have anything to do with green beer or whatever uh, you know that's not what saint patrick is about you you read the life of saint patrick in the fifth century saint patrick was abducted and carried off captive to ireland from england very harsh circumstances only by the mercy and grace of god he escaped his captors and at near death, made it back to England, almost starving to death on the way. When he got back to England, God began to do a work in his life. And his family was just astonished when he announced to them, God wants me to go back to Ireland and share the gospel. And they opposed strongly him doing that. But he just told them, I believe God has called me to go back into the place where he had been treated so, so poorly and to share the gospel with the Irish people. He went back. He was uh, uh, kidnapped at least three more times. There were 12 near-death experiences that he went through. Uh, it was uh, just in incredible uh, that all that took place there. He, he writes in his, his confessions, he was bound by the Spirit to preach the gospel to the Irish and to pour out his life among them. You see, for him, he understood the, the final command was to go to the ends of the earth. And for them, in that century, Ireland was the ends of the earth. They didn't think there was anything beyond that. And so he, he was doing what Jesus had commanded him to do. He was going to the ends of the earth with the gospel. And under incredible, incredible persecution, he stood strong and represented Jesus Christ well in Ireland. Beginning of this year, I came across one of his prayers that, that, that I've adapted and tweaked just a little bit. This is what I want to pray every day. Jesus with me, Jesus before me. Jesus behind me, Jesus in me. Jesus beneath me, Jesus above me. Jesus on my right, Jesus on my left. Jesus when I lie down, Jesus when I sit, Jesus when I stand, 
Jesus in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Jesus in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Jesus in every eye that sees me, Jesus in every ear that hears me. Amen. To give him Jesus. My daughter gave me last Christmas a little wall hanging. It comes from that very familiar song to you where it states there, uh, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. I've got that on the wall in my study where I do my devotions every morning. And I know that when you look first at that, that's kind of a personal prayer. And I get that. In the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus. But here's how I've kind of adapted that when I look at it every morning. When I go out the doors of my study, I'm reminded that the world out there needs me to give them Jesus. That it's not about giving them Steve. It's not about giving them theology. It's not about giving them stuff. I believe the world is asking the church, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Because it's Jesus who will make a difference. This morning, in a few moments, we're going to close our time with singing, Give Me Jesus, together. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to remind you the gospel truth. Jesus died for you. It's that simple. Jesus died on the cross for you. Jesus in my place is what the gospel is all about. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know Jesus wants to make a difference in your life. I'll be up here at the front. I know there are others in this church that would be happy to to share with you Jesus. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we won't want you to leave today without Jesus. And then if you're here and you know Jesus, I want to encourage you, whatever it is God's prompting you to do. I'm just real comfortable if people want to come and kneel and pray and just do business with Jesus. If you're physically unable to kneel, you might want to make one of these front rows here, just an altar, and you come and sit and pray, whatever God's leading you to do. If you have another decision you need to make, if you need somebody to pray with you, you've probably got somebody that came with you and just grab them by the hand and say, will you go pray with me? They'll, they'll come pray with you. I feel confident of that. If not, if you just need something, we'll find somebody to pray with you. Whatever it takes this morning, we want to come into the presence of Jesus and leave this place worshiping him for his glory, for his honor, for his praise. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the opportunity just to open your word today and to trust the power of your Holy Spirit to communicate far beyond the ability of my vocabulary. Thank you, Jesus, for being in this place, for speaking to hearts in depths that I could not even imagine. And now, Father, in these next few moments, we want to respond to what you've said. Our hearts want to be sensitive. We want to say yes to Jesus. We want to say, give me Jesus. And then we want to go into the world to give them Jesus. Because it's Jesus that makes a difference. For your glory. For your honor. For your praise. And we pray these things. In the name of the one who invited us to do so and then went to the cross to make it possible for us to come in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that we can rise and walk for your glory. Father, if you want us to rise and walk today, we want to be obedient to you. Respond to Jesus. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing, Give Me Jesus. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus.
Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Who when I am alone, who when I am alone, who when I am alone. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. to die oh when I come to die oh when I come to die give me Jesus give me Jesus Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Lord, I pray as we finish that you would keep our eyes on you. The things of this world would go strangely dim. And that we would focus on, on you, what you've done for us, and that we'd share it with those around us. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. You're dismissed. If you're coming for the choir meeting, we're in the choir room. If you're coming for the signers meeting, we'll be in A2. God bless.